Torto. Grandmer was silent for a few seconds. She was looking into the air like she could see it all happening again right in front of her. Now I understood why she had never talked about this before. It was too hard for her. Torto's family hid me for two years in that barn. She continued slowly, even though it was so dangerous for them. We were literally surrounded by Germans and the French police had a large headquarters in Don Villiers. But every day I thanked my maker for the barn that was my home and the food that Torto managed to bring me, even when there was hardly any food to go around. People were starving in those days, Julian, and yet they fed me. It was a kindness that I will never forget. It is always brave to be kind, but in those days, such kindnesses could cost you your life. Grandmère started to get teary-eyed at this point. She took my hand. The last time I saw Torto was two months before the liberation. He had brought me some soup. It wasn't even soup. It was water with a little bit of bread and onions in it. We had both lost so much weight. I was in rags, so much for my pretty clothes. Even so, we managed to laugh, Torto and I. We laughed about things that happened in our school. Even though I could got, not go, any, go there anymore, of course, Torto still went every day. At night, he would tell me everything he had learned so that I would stay smart. He would tell me about all my old friends, too, and how they were doing. They all still ignored him, of course, and he never revealed to any of them that I was still alive. No one could know. No one could be trusted. But Torto was an excellent narrator, and he made me laugh a lot. He could do wonderful imitations, and he even had funny nicknames for all my friends. Imagine that. Torto was making fun of them. I had no idea you were so mischievous, I told him. All those years, you were probably laughing at me behind my back, too. Laughing at you, he said? Never. I had a crush on you. I never laughed at you. Besides, I only laughed at the kids who made fun of me. You never made fun of me. You simply ignored me. I called you Torto. And so? Everyone called me that. I really don't mind. I like crabs. Oh, Torto, I'm so ashamed, I answered. And I remember I covered my face with both my hands. At this point, Grandmère covered her face with her hands. Although her fingers were bent with arthritis now and I could see her veins, I pictured her young hands covering her young face so many years ago. Torto took my hands with his own hands, she continued, slowly removing her hands from her face, and he held my hands for a second. I was 14 years old then, and I had never kissed a boy, but he kissed me that day, Julian. Grandmère closed her eyes and took a deep breath. After he kissed me, I said to him, I don't want to call you Torto anymore. What is your name? Grandmère opened her eyes and looked at me. Can you guess what he said, she asked. I raised my eyebrows as if to say, no, how would I know? Then she closed her eyes again and smiled. He said, my name is Julian. Julian. Oh my God, I cried. That's why you named Dad Julian. Even though everyone called him Jules, that was his name. We, oui, she said, nodding. And I'm named after dad, I said, so I'm named after this kid. That's so cool. She smiled and ran her fingers through my hair, but she didn't say anything. Then I remembered her saying, the last time I saw Torto, so what happened to him, I asked, to Julian. Almost instantaneously, tears rolled down Grandmère's cheeks. The Germans took him, she said, that same day. He was on his way to school. They were making another sweep of the village that morning. By now, Germany was losing the war, and they knew it. But I said he wasn't even Jewish. They took him because he was crippled, she said between sobs. I'm sorry. I know you told me that word is a bad word, but I don't know how, I don't know another word in English. He was an invalid. That is the word in French. And that is why they took him. He was not perfect. She practically spat out the word. They took all the imperfects from the village that day. It was a purge. The gypsies, the shoemaker's son who was simple, and Julian, my torteau. They put him in a cart with the others, and then he was put on a train to Drancy, and from there to Auschwitz, like my mother. We heard later from someone who saw him there that they sent him to the gas chambers right away. Just like that, poof, he was gone. My savior, my little Julian. She stopped to wipe her eyes with a handkerchief and then drank the rest of the wine. His parents were devastated, of course. Mademoiselle, uh, Monsieur Beaumier and Mademoiselle Beaumier, she continued. We didn't find out who uh, didn't find out he was dead until after the liberation, but we knew, we knew. She dabbed her eyes. I lived with them for another year after the war. They treated me like a daughter. They were the ones who helped me track down Papa, 
although it took some time to find him. So much chaos in those days. When Papa finally was able to return to Paris, I went to live with him. But I always visited the Beaumiers, even when they were too, very old. I never forgot the kindness that they showed me. She sighed. She had finished her story. Grand Mare, I said after a few minutes, that's like the saddest thing I've ever heard. I didn't even know you were in the war. I mean, Dad's never talked about any of this. She shrugged. I think it's very possible that I never told your father this story, she said. I don't like to talk about sad things, you know. In some ways, I'm still the frivolous girl I used to be. But when I heard you talking about that little boy in your school, I could not help but think of Torto, of how afraid I had once been of him, of how badly we had treated him because of his deformity. Those children had been so mean to him, Julian, it breaks my heart to think of it. When she said that, I don't know, something just really broke inside of me, completely unexpected. I looked down and all of a sudden I started to cry. And when I start, say I started to cry, I don't mean a few tears rolling down my cheeks. I mean like full scale, snot filled crying. Julian, she said softly. I shook my head and covered my face with my hands. I was terrible, Grand Mare, I whispered. I was so mean to Augie. I'm so sorry, Grand Mare. Julian, she said again, look at me. No. Look at me, mon cher. She took my face in her hands and forced me to look at her. I felt so embarrassed. I really couldn't look her in the eyes. Suddenly, that word that Mr. Tushman had used, that word that everyone kept trying to force on me, came to me like a shout. Remorse. Yeah, there it was. That word in all its glory. Remorse. I was shaking with remorse. I was crying with remorse. Julian, said Grandmère, we all make mistakes, mon cher. No, you don't understand, I answered. It wasn't just one mistake. I was those kids who, was mean, who were mean to Torteau. I was the bully, Grandmère. It was me. She nodded. I called him a freak. I laughed behind his back. I left mean notes. I screamed. Mom kept making excuses for why I did that stuff. But there wasn't any excuse. I just did it. And I don't even know why. I don't even know. I was crying so hard I couldn't even speak. Grandmère stroked my head and hugged me. Julian, she said softly, you are so young. The things you did, you know they were not right. But that does not mean you are not capable of doing right. It only means that you chose to do wrong. This is what I mean when I say you made a mistake. It was the same with me. I made a mistake with Torto. But the good, things about life, Jul good thing about life, Julian, she continued, is that we can fix our mistakes sometimes. We learn from them, we get better. I never made a mistake like the one I made with Torto again, not with anyone in my life. And I have had a very, very long life. You will learn from your mistake too. You must promise yourself that you will never behave like that with anyone else again. One mistake does not define you, Julian. Do you understand me? You must simply act better next time. I nodded, but I still cried for a long, long time after that. My dream. That night, I dreamt about Augie. I don't remember the details of the dream, but I think we were being chased by Nazis. Augie was captured, but I had a key to let him out. And in my dream, I think I saved him. Or maybe that's what I told myself when I woke up. Sometimes it's hard to know with dreams. I mean, in this dream, the Nazis all looked like Darth Vader's imperial officers anyway, so it's hard to put too much meaning into dreams. But what was really interesting to me when I thought about it is that it had been a dream, not a nightmare. And in the dream, Augie and I were on the same side. I woke up super early because of the dream and didn't go back to sleep. I kept thinking about Augie and Torto, Julian, the heroic boy I was named for. It's weird. This whole time, I had been thinking about Augie like he was my enemy. But when Grandmère told me that story, I don't know, it all kind of just sank in with me. I kept thinking of how ashamed the original Julian would be to know that someone who carried his name had been so mean. I kept thinking about how sad Grandmère was when she told the story. How she could remember all the details, even though it happened like 70 years ago. 70 years. Would Augie remember me in 70 years? Would he still remember the mean things I called him? I don't want to be remembered for stuff like that. I would want to be remembered the way Grand Mare remembers Torto. Mr. Tushman, I get it now. R-E-M-O-R-S-E. -E. I got up as soon as it was light out and wrote this note. Dear Augie, I want to apologize for the stuff I did last year. I've been thinking about it a lot. You didn't deserve it. I wish I could have a do-over. I would be nicer. I hope you don't remember how mean I was when you're 80 years old. Have a nice life. Julian, P.S. If you're the one who told Mr. Tushman about the notes, don't worry. I don't blame you. When Grandmère woke up that afternoon, I read her the note. I'm proud of you, Julian, she said, squeezing my shoulder. Do you think he'll forgive me? 
She thought about it. That's up to him, she answered. In the end, mon cher, all that matters is that you forgive yourself. You are learning from your mistake, like I learned with Torteau. Do you think Torteau would forgive me? I asked if he knew his namesake had been so mean. She kissed my hand. Torteau would forgive you, she answered. And I could tell she meant it. Going home. I realized I didn't have Augie's address, so I wrote another email to Mr. Brown asking him if I could send him my note to Augie and have him mail it for me. Mr. Brown emailed back immediately. He was happy to do it. He also said he was proud of me. I felt good about that. I mean, like, really good. And it felt good to feel good. Kind of hard to explain, but I guess I was kind of feeling like I was this awful kid. I'm not. Like I keep seeing over and over again, I'm just an ordinary kid, a typical, normal, ordinary kid who made a mistake. But now I was trying to make it right. My parents arrived a week later. Mom couldn't stop hugging and kissing me. This was the longest I had ever been away from home. I was excited to tell them about the email from Mr. Brown and the note I had written to Augie, but they told me their news first. We are suing the school, said Mom excitedly. What? I cried. Dad is suing them for breach of contract, she said. She was practically chirping. I looked at Grand Mare, who didn't say anything. We were all having dinner. They had no right to withdraw the enrollment contract, Dad explained calmly like a lawyer. Not before we had been placed in another school. Hal told me in his office that after they would wait to rescind their enrollment offer until after we had gotten accepted into another school and they would return the money, we had a verbal agreement. But I was going to another school anyway, I said. Doesn't matter, he said. Even if they return the money, it's the principle of the thing. What principle, said Grand Mare. She got up from the table. This is nonsense, Jules. Stupid. Stupid. Complete and utter nonsense. Mama, said Dad. He looked really surprised. So did Mom. You should drop this stupidity, said Grand Mare. You don't really know the details, Mama, said Dad. I know all the details, she yelled, shaking her fist in the air. She looked fierce. The boy was wrong, Jules. Your boy was in the wrong. He knows it. You know it. He did bad things to that other boy, and he is sorry for them, and you should let it be. Mom and Dad looked at each other. With all due respect, Sarah, said Mom, I think we know what's best for... No, you don't know anything, yelled Grand Mare. You don't know. You two are too busy with lawsuits and stupid things like that. Mama, said Dad. She's right, Dad, I said. It was all my fault. All that stuff with Augie, it was my fault. I was mean to him for no reason. It was my fault Jack punched me. And I had just called Augie a freak. What? said Mom. I wrote those awful notes, I said quickly. I did mean stuff. It was my fault. I was the bully, Mom. It wasn't anyone else's fault but mine. Mom and Dad didn't seem to know what to answer. Instead of sitting there like two idiots, said Grand Mare, who always said things like they were, you should be praising Julian for this admission. He is taking responsibility. He is owning up to his mistakes. It takes much courage to do this kind of thing. Yes, of course, said Dad, rubbing his chin and looking at me, but I just don't think that you understand all the legal ramifications. The school took our tuition and refused to return it, which blah, 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 said Grand Mare, waving him away. I wrote him an apology, I said, to Augie. I wrote him an apology, and I sent it to him in the mail. I apologized for the way I acted. You what, said Dad? He was getting mad now. And I told Mr. Brown the truth, too, I added. I wrote Mr. Brown a long email telling him the whole story. Julian, said Dad, frowning angrily. Why did you do that? I told you I didn't want you to write anything that acknowledged Jules, said Grand Mare loudly, waving her hand in front of Dad's face. I'm not even going to pretend I can pronounce all of this, but I can see sandwich and fromage, which is cheese. <laughs> I couldn't help but laugh at this, Dad cringed. What did she say, asked Mom, who didn't know French. Grand Mare just told Dad he has a brain like a cheese sandwich, I said. Mama, Dad said sternly, like someone who was about to begin a long lecture. But Mom reached out and put her ha hand on Dad's arm. Jules, she said quietly, I think your mom is right. Unexpected. Sometimes people surprise you. Never in a million years would I have thought my mom would be the one to back down from anything, so I was completely shocked by what she had just said. I could tell Dad was, too. He looked at Mom like he couldn't believe what she was saying. Grand Mare was the only one who didn't seem surprised. Are you kidding me? Dad said to Mom. 
Mom shook her head slowly. Jules, we should end this. We should move on. Your mother's right. Dad raised his eyebrows. I knew he was mad, but trying not to show it. You're the one who got us on this war path, Melissa. I know, she answered, taking her glasses off. Her eyes were really shiny. I know, I know, and I thought it was the right thing to do at the time. I still don't think Tushman was right the way he handled everything, but I'm ready to put all this behind us now, Jules. I think we should just let go and move forward. She shrugged. She looked at me. It was very big of Julian to reach out to that boy, Jules. It takes a lot of guts to do that. She looked back at Dad. We should be supportive. I am supportive, of course, said Dad, but this is such a complete about face, Melissa. I mean, he shook his head and rolled his eyes at the same time. Mom sighed. She didn't know what to say. Look here, said Grandmere. Whatever Melissa did, she did it because she wanted Julian to be happy. And that is all. Safe too. And he's happy now. You can see it in his eyes. For the first time in a long time, your son looks completely happy. That's exactly right, said Mom, wiping a tear from her face. I felt kind of sorry for Mom at that moment. I could tell she felt bad about some of the things she had done. Dad, I said, please don't sue the school. I don't want that. Okay, Dad, please? Dad leaned back in his chair and made a soft whistle sound like he was blowing out a candle in slow motion. Then he started clicking his tongue against the roof of his mouth. It was a long minute that he stayed like that, and we just watched him. Finally, he sat back up in his chair and looked at us. He shrugged. Okay, he said, his palms up. I'll drop the lawsuit. We'll just walk away from the tuition money. Are you sure that's what you want, Melissa? Mom nodded. I'm sure. Grand Mare sighed. Victory at last, she mumbled into her wine glass. Starting over. We went home a week later, but not before Grand Mare took us to a very special place, the village she grew up in. It seemed amazing to me that she had never told Dad the whole Torteau story. The only thing he knew was that a family in Don Villiers had helped her during the war, but she had never told him any of the details. She had never told him that his own grandmother had died in a concentration camp. Mama, how come you never told me any of this? Dad asked her while we were driving in the car to her village. Oh, you know me, Jules, she answered. I do not like to dwell on the past. Life is ahead of us. If we spend too much time looking backward, we can't see where we are going. Much of the village had changed. Too many bombs and grenades had been dropped. Most of the original houses had been destroyed in the war. Grandmere's school was gone. There was really nothing much to see, just Starbucks and shoe stores. But then we drove to Don Villiers, which is where Julian had lived. That village was intact. She took us to the barn where she had stayed for two years. The old farmer who lived there now let us walk around and take a look. Grandmere found her initial scrawled in a little nook in one of the horse stalls, which is where she would hide under piles of hay whenever the Nazis were nearby. Grandmere stood in the middle of the barn with only one hand on her face as she looked around. She seemed so tiny there. How are you doing, Grandmere? I asked. Me? Ah, well, she said, smiling. She tilted her head. I lived. I remember thinking when I was staying here that the smell of horse manure would never leave my nostrils, but I lived. And Jules was born because I lived, and you were born. So what is the smell of horse manure against all that? Perfume and time make everything easier to bear. Now there's one more place I want to visit. We drove around about 10 minutes away to a tiny cemetery on the outskirts of the village. Grand Mare took us directly to a tombstone at the edge of the graveyard. There was a small white ceramic plaque on the tombstone. It was in the shape of a heart, and it read, so you guys, these are in French, but this is Vivienne Beaumier and her birth date and death date. Jean-Paul Beaumier, his birth date and death date. Notice that it's July uh, 5th of 1985, November 21st of 1985. Um, and then Julian August Beaumier. What do you notice about that? Julian August Beaumier. This is Torteau. And he was born on October 10th, 1930. And he died, they're not exactly sure when, but he died um, at Auschwitz. I looked at Grand Mare as she stood looking at the plaque. She kissed her fingers and then she reached down to touch it. She was trembling. They treated me like a daughter, she said, tears rolling down her cheeks. She started sobbing. I took her hand and kissed it. Mom took dad's hand. What does the plaque say, she asked softly. Dad cleared his throat. Here rests Vivienne Beaumier, he translated softly, and Jean-Paul Beaumier, mother and father of Julian August Beaumier, born October 10th, 1930, killed June 1944. May he for walk forever tall in the garden of God. 
New York. We got back to New York City a week before my new school was scheduled to start. It was nice being in my room again. My things were all the same, but I felt, I don't know, a little different. I can't explain it. I felt like I was really starting over. I'll help you unpack in a minute, said mom, running off to the bathroom as soon as we stepped through the door. I'm good, I answered. I could hear dad in the living room listening to our answering machine messages. I started unpacking my suitcase. Then I heard a familiar voice on the machine. I stopped what I was doing and walked into the living room. Dad looked up and paused the machine. Then he replayed the message for me to hear. It was Augie Pullman. Oh, hi, Julian, said the message. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to tell you I got your note. And um, yeah, thanks for writing it. No need to call me back. I just wanted to say, hey, we're good. Oh, and by the way, it wasn't me who told Tushman about the notes, just so you know, or Jack or Summer. I really don't know how he found out. Not that it matters anyway. So, okay, anyway, I hope you like your new school. Good luck. Bye. Click. Dad looked at me to see how I would react. Wow, I said, I didn't expect that at all. Are you going to call him back, asked Dad. I shook my head. Nah, I answered. I'm too chicken. Dad walked over to me and put his hand on my shoulder. I think you've proven that you're anything but chicken, he said. I'm proud of you, Julian, very proud of you. He leaned over and hugged me. Tu marches toujours le front hot. I smiled. I hope so, Dad. I hope so.